Welcome to another episode of Ask the Zamboni Experts. I'm your host, Doug Peters. Our guest on today's episode is Liz Mangeldorf, the Managing Director of Ice Sports Industry, the ISI. Today, we're going to be talking about the ISI and the programs that they have to offer, as well as the history of the ISI. Welcome, Liz, and thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks, Doug. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to being here today. Great, great. Um, if you could uh, let us know, how did you get your start in the skating world? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I was a skater myself, started skating. Um, it's kind of the same story I think a lot of people in the industry might have. Um, I went to a birthday party at an ice rink and uh, liked skating and asked my mom if I could take lessons and there you go, started skating. Flash forward lots of years later and um, started working in an ice rink and quickly decided that it was something that I wanted to do. Began coaching. Um, kind of got thrown in the deep end, uh, dealing with skating programs, that sort of thing. Um, ended up becoming a skating director down here in Dallas, Texas, and um, overseeing quite a few facilities that were run by the Dallas Stars. Um, worked for them for probably over 13 years and um, was part of ISI through the whole entire thing. So I guess my story just kind of unfolds into that. Um, I don't know, I guess not to get too, uh, not to get too deep at the beginning of the, of the, uh, the podcast, but um, I do believe in hard work, um, believe in, you know, working towards what you want and how to get there. But I also really do believe in, in fate, karma. Sometimes a path leads you down a way that you will never expect to go. And um, to think that I was an eight, nine, 10, 11 year old kid skating uh, working in the ISI program, and then many years later, here I am managing the organization that was started so long ago. Where was that birthday party at that uh, got you started on your skating career? Well, actually, um, that was in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and um, I was in the witness protection program for a long time with my family. Um, no, um, I was not, but um, I did move around a ton as a kid. <laughs> Did move around at the time of the, um, a lot when I was a kid. Um, so I did actually start skating when I was in Georgia, but did the majority of my skating actually in all places, but um, Louisville, Kentucky, which, you know, normally you don't really think is the booming metropolis of ice skating. Um, but it was, and the irony of, again, back to my path was that I took from Erica Amundsen and then I took from Robert Unger, um, who were all, you know, obviously, as we know, um, founding members and people that really drew the course of the ISI as we know it today. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I mean, who knew back then, right? I agree. So share with us about your family and some of the places that you've lived. I've learned a couple of things today that I didn't know about <laughs> you. Being a, a Georgia a girl, maybe that's why the peach pie is one of your favorites. Um, a little bit uh, about your time in Kentucky and, and where else you might have uh, lived. Yeah, I mean, I was one of those kids that um, we moved around a lot and not for any reason, except I think my dad just, you know, he found great jobs and moved up higher in different companies and switched around. So we did move around a lot. I was actually born in Virginia. Um, so, okay, I'll list the states for you. I was born in Virginia, lived in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Missouri, Kentucky, Oregon, and then now Texas. So I sort of have to claim, I, you know, to be frank, I claim Oregon is my home, which I think you know, lived there for 11, 12 years, but um, I think I definitely have to claim Texas as my new home, considering I married a Texan, have two Texas kids, and have lived here for 20 years. So there you go. 20 years, that's a long time. It's uh, <laughs> hard, to, hard to believe that uh, somebody who's, uh, what, 30, 31, has exactly. uh, been in Texas for 20 years, been able to visit all those other states. That's amazing. Yeah. I lived but, each place for like a week or so, I think. Yeah, I, I know that when I crossed the line, I moved to California when I was 25. And when I cross the line of uh, more time in California, I, I think I'm more Californian than I am Minnesota. It's kind of hard to get that out of me. A uh, great place to visit, not a place that uh, I want to 
reside when it's 20 below for a week. So I know when I moved from Oregon to Texas, people always ask me, how could you leave Oregon? It's so gorgeous. You know, it's beautiful. An hour from the beach, an hour from mountains. But I did say when I moved to Texas, there's something pretty awesome about sitting on a patio in January drinking margaritas. That there is, that there is. And it's like I'm uh, thinking about putting on a sweatshirt today because we are only going to be in the 50s, I think, today is the high. And some people might find that to be a bit crazy. But when you're used to 75 degree weather and it's 50 degrees, that's a 25 degree temperature drop. And it's no different than going from zero to 25 and the flip flops and the shorts come out at 25 degrees. 100%, 100%. So, Liz, have you ever driven a Zamboni machine? I have driven a Zamboni. And where was that? It was at the ice rink in Oregon that I worked at, and um, they kind of made everybody learn how to drive the Zamboni so that we had a concept of what the operations guys had to go through. And actually, it was, it was a really good thing. When I did move to Texas and I, I took jobs in ice rinks here in Texas, I actually, to be honest with you, though, kept that piece of my resume quiet because I never wanted anybody to call me at 5 a.m. and say, hey, the Zamboni driver is still asleep. Can you come in and resurface the ice before freestyle? Well, I like to say ignorance is bliss and I like to be as blissful as possible. So I quite understand what you're saying there. <laughs> You shared with me that uh, you've had a couple radio gigs in your life and since I went to school to become a radio broadcaster and I've spent most of my career selling ice resurfacers for the Zamboni company. <laughs> my dream gig would have been to be a sports play-by-play -play announcer and we're going to, I'm so excited because uh, this is National Women's Month and to have you on, that's an uh, awesome part of it. Uh, we're also going to have Lindsay Fry who's a radio analyst for the Phoenix Coyotes or Arizona Coyotes. Uh, looking much forward to that because she's an Olympian. Um, tell us about your radio gigs and what that was like and where those gigs happened. Well, I'm not sure you can really call them a gig, but um, <laughs> that was a million years ago, too. But um, again, you know, your path of, of interesting things along, along your career path. And I do believe that <clears throat> all the different things that you do along your way lead you to where you are in terms of you know, gaining different insight into things. So um, I worked for a radio station in Eugene, Oregon. It's called KDUK, KDUK 106.1 on the FM dial. It was a uh, top 40 radio station. Um, and actually, I, uh, I got a job there out of college, and I was a traffic controller, which most people feel like, oh, traffic, that means you're talking about, you know, the wrecks on 635 and the pile up on the high five, but traffic and radio was actually, I don't even know if it's called this still say, but back in the day, it was how do you put commercials on the air? Um, you know, and so back then we actually had tapes, <laughs> again, aging myself, nothing was digital, you had tapes. And so you would align them up, you know, your commercial spots from McDonald's or Toyota or Safeway. Um, and so you ran traffic. Um, so that's what I did. Long story short, I ended up morphing into office manager, accounting manager, all that stuff on the radio station, small radio station. And because I was younger at the time and maybe a little bit of more fun than I am today, um, I was on the air a lot with the morning crew. And if, you know, if any of you all have ever listened to morning radio, those crews are crazy. And so, um, you know, I had a persona. I was on the morning show and would pop in every now and then and uh, do the update on Melrose Place. And what happened at Melrose Place the week before? Um, so it was a super, super fun time in my life. I mean, you can't get much more fun than being crazy on the on the radio, right? So has K Duck ever called you to do a retro program with Liz? <laughs> no, but that would be super fun. I mean, who knows? Those people are never even there. I I actually should check it out. I'm not even sure that radio station still exists. I'm sure it does. Um, I'm sure sure it does. But then flash forward, uh, just had, you know, had a decent line item on my resume working for radio, working in radio. And so when I moved to Dallas, one of my first jobs here while I was trying to find a coaching, ice skating coaching job, I worked for KRLD, 1080 on the AM dial. Um, and I worked in accounting, which is not really fun or glorious or sexy or any of those things. But um, 
it was fun and they always needed people to go on the air and do different things. So I did like, you know, a mattress commercial and, you know, I don't know, other commercials where you'd be like in the background. Um, but fun place to work. Plus one little tidbit at the time, Carol D radio was located in the ballpark in Arlington, which ironically doesn't exist anymore. Just literally shut down last year and the Texas Rangers baseball team have a brand new stadium. Um, but so every day our, our offices were on the ground floor and every day, like during lunch, you could just walk out and sit in the bleachers at the baseball stadium and watch the landscape crew take maintain the ballpark. And that was, that was pretty awesome. So met a lot of Texas Rangers baseball players and it was a good time. That was a, that was a fun gig. So which college I'm going to ask kind of facetiously, because I know that you're a huge fan of a certain team. So I have to assume <laughs> that that team you are a fan of is where you went. And what did uh, what did you major degree in or um, go to school for? I did, I went to uh, University of Oregon. And um, again, you know, I don't know how many people out there have a degree that they, I don't know why you got that degree that you got, right? But um, I have a degree in sociology, which is, you know, the study of humankind and people and social interactions. So I suppose I use that in my everyday life now. But um, a degree in sociology and a, I have a minor in business. Okay, so would that have worked in like the movie Animal House when they went to the bar? Um, hey, your degree in sociology or no? Exactly. Do not get me started <laughs> on Animal House because I could talk for an out, entire hour podcast on Animal House because that was filmed on my campus. And okay. um, Anyway, back in the day, I was not around when they filmed it, but um, it was back in my day. And, okay, I've got to talk a little ditty, and if this just gets cut from the podcast, it gets cut. But um, the actual Animal House, if you've seen the movie, that house resided on the Oregon campus for years and years and years and years and years. And it was like a, um, like a commune type of house. You know, people would live in and move out. Anyway, they um, tore it down. They sold the land to the hospital that was building next to the University of Oregon, the hospital across the street brought the property, they sold it, and they tore the house down. I mean, it looked horrible, but I was there because, of course, I'm from Oregon, so I'm a good, I love a good protest, out there with the best of them protesting. I mean, everybody thought they should have turned it into, like, a coffee house or something really fun like that, um, but anyway, it's gone, but I have pictures. I have pictures of myself sitting in the front of it, so there you go. That's awesome. You need to share one of those. We can use that as one of the pictures uh, as part of the podcast when we publish this. That, that that would be awesome. All right, I'll have to dig it up. There you go. It's uh, it's interesting because that movie has been on recently. What I want to know, did the horse really die? When it did not he die. Pointed, it did not die, okay. No, it did not die. And a really good friend of mine in high school, her mother plays the like secretary, the assistant to the dean. So, um, yep, that was Anna's mom. So there you go. That's good. That's good. It's it's interesting because there, um, Bob Hayden, who's one of the the names from the past, uh, his wife Katie ran a successful skating school out east. He was in a movie, The Departed, and it was funny when I was at the movie. He was in at the very end of it. Maybe you, you're shaking your head that no, you didn't know that. But uh, if you watch that movie, and I'm, I'm pretty The Departed, that's with uh leonard dicaprio and jack nicholson it's about set in boston it's basically about uh whitey bulger's life um but at the very end when there's the funeral for martin sheen who flew off the building and learned he couldn't fly um he was standing in line giving the salute but that was pretty cool when you run across somebody that you know um that is in a flick so that, that's that's cool that's interesting. Um, seeing as how you were spending time at the ballpark, uh, were any baseball fan or baseball players, were any of those your hero? If not, who's your sports hero? Have you been able to meet that person? That's, that's a good question. Um, you know, I've never been like one of those like total starstruck fan gals or whatever. I think it's very interesting to meet people that are incredibly incredibly, incredibly gifted, talented, hardworking at their craft. So I always think that's interesting. I mean, you know, honestly, my go-tos have to be, you know, skaters from my day, you know, 
getting to meet Peggy Fleming and Dorothy Hamill was phenomenal. Getting to meet Scott Hamilton, um, you know, just as a, as a small girl, you know, watching them on TV at the time. Um, so, and I've had the opportunity to meet Scott Hamilton several times and actually, um, not too long ago, three, four years ago, sat down and talked to him one-on-one, um, about what he's doing with the Scott Cares Foundation and things like that. So that's always pretty cool. I mean, you know, they put their pants on like everybody else does. So they're all, they're all pretty human, but it is pretty cool to meet somebody that, you know, especially that you aspire to be growing up, that sort of thing. Um, my one little tidbit that I cannot remember if you know or not, but, um, I do know Tanya Hardy, which is always, um, you know, my little interesting tidbit because I feel like, you know, extra should have called me during that time period and maybe paid me lots of money to give some dirt on her. Um, but, uh, anyway, Knowing Tanya Harding was interesting for sure, by any means. That's funny because there's a guy that used to skate and work at the Harbor City ice rink uh, down in Torrance. And he was a pair skater. And I used to go out and have beers with him occasionally. And he told some stories about Tanya. And I guess that she was somewhat of a party girl. And maybe you can. Tell us, did you teach her how to throw a hubcap or was that something she just learned on her own? I think she learned that on her own. I mean, she was really young when I met her. She came and did an ice show at our rink and um, I kind of was in charge of like getting her from place to place and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I always do say, you know, in hindsight, now that I'm older too, you know, it's situations like that are kind of sad. Like she probably, I mean, if I'm going on a limb, she had the most incredible raw talent, you know? And so, you know, to kind of like, quote unquote, throw away her life and her skating career the way that she did, you know, it was kind of sad. I mean, really, um, you know, people make choices. She made the choices that she made, but still interesting, interesting story for her, for sure. Well, I think the life, if the movie is anything like her life, and I've had a few people that I know in the skating industry that have told me that that's pretty close to accurate. I mean, Mm -hmm. Allison Janney, she won an Academy Award for her portrayal of uh, Tanya's crazy mother, and I think that she is spot on. (laughs) Anybody who's got a mother that walks around with a bird on her shoulder um, can't be the... um, potential for being mother of the year so i think that tanya tanya had a tough life to to start out with and uh you know and i've heard the same thing what you said is that her talent level or skill set was such that nobody else had and did she not land one of the first whatever numbered jumps a triple or a quad whatever it was (laughs) triple axel yeah she was the first um american she was the first american woman in American competition to land a triple axel. So it's, I mean, yeah. you know, impressive. So, you know, you mentioned you're impressed by being with people who are gifted and talented and such. Is that why you enjoy spending time with me? <laughs> 100%. I, I couldn't think of a better way to frame that. I mean, just that was, that's a spot on phrase right there. These podcasts are a bit self-serving for me to build up my ego a little bit. <laughs> well, hey, everybody needs a pat on the back every now and then. Yeah, I mean, it's if, what, if you can't do it yourself, then who can, right? It's why I had to have shoulder surgery because I was always reaching around and yeah. patting myself on my back. So, do you have like you have your like little uh, affirmations written on the mirror when you look at yourself in the mirror every morning? I try to avoid looking at the mirror because I'm afraid what I'm going to see one and two, I'm afraid that I might crack the mirror. So I I have a voice for radio or I'm sorry, a face for radio and a voice for TV is what, uh, what I've been told in the past. So uh, can we get We're going to get into the ISIA, which uh, is what the ISI was formerly known as and the history of it. And one of the founding fathers um, was Frank Zamboni who founded our company that uh, I've been, lucky enough to be employed for as long as I have. Uh, Can you tell us when it was founded and what was the purpose of the ISIA when it first came out? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so back, it started in 1959, um, over 60 years ago, and it was the Ice Skating Institute of America, because at the time it just was going to encompass, you know, the United States. Um, They dropped the America 
several years later um, after they formed some agreements with um, Asia. But you know, back in the day, it's interesting when you when you think about the history. And I am not the expert by any means on the history of the ISI. I do my best to do a lot of reading and researching to kind of maintain that history and that foundation that we have and where we are today, even though times have changed so much since then. It really is interesting when we, you know, I'll kind of digress for a second. We rebranded re ourselves and refreshed ourselves a little bit back in 2016, 2017. We looked back at 1959 and 60 in the early 60s and, you know, realized that there was a group, mostly men at the time, that wanted to form a cohesive group to help each other maintain ice rinks, to build ice rinks, and to make ice rinks a place where they could, yeah, I mean, lots of things, earn a living. You know, they believed heartily in, you know, ice sports and what that had to offer for people, and they wanted like-minded people that they could bounce ideas off, share ideas, um, ask each other questions, and they were also giving of each other at the time that, you know, embracing that and realizing that is something that I still try to hold on to as to where we are now, because I think there can kind of be an inherent concept that people feel like everybody else is their competitor. And so therefore, um, they don't want to share this secret or share this secret, or they don't want to give up too much information, don't want to be too transparent. And back then they were so transparent. And I think that's what helped them be successful moving on that they could bounce those ideas off each other and say to each other, hey, this isn't working. How can we make this work? Um, you know, it quickly grew, grew a lot, as you said, um, with owners and operators and then the side of what we now call builders and suppliers, you know, vendors. And, and they grew with each other. And, you know, here we are today, well over 60 years later. Well, and it's interesting, and I can only theorize because even as old as I am, um, I wasn't around in the days that this first got its start. Um, but Frank Zamboni was a founder, and I think that it, probably to a degree with some of the other members, uh, and, and even going to like Murray Sandler, who's one of the, the legends of the ISI, I think that as a supplier, you want the industry to succeed. And if the industry succeeds, then in theory, your supplying product to it should should grow as well. And I certainly agree with your point about uh, members being probably a little bit more willing and open to share uh, ideas and concepts. And, and I would hope that our industry, especially now with what we're going through, that people will bond together and realize that the more they come together, the better it's going to be for everybody. Yes, you might have a short-term little blip uh, if somebody opens up a facility 20 miles from you, but the whole idea and the thing I love about the ISI is the concept of growing the business. And Absolutely. if you, you make it more accessible to people and you make the programs something that they desire, the, the users desire that it's going to make things better. So maybe give us your take on that as well, Liz. Well, I was just going to say that's a good segue because, you know, that for me, that's what the ISI is all about. I mean, our, you know, our mission statement, I'll just read it, is dedicated to providing leadership, education, and services to the ice skating interest industry since 1959. And I mean, honestly, it, it's, it's amazing because that is our mission statement. That's what we strive to do. And Nobody in this industry can be successful unless we're all successful together. Um, you know, that's a something that I say on a regular basis to to members, to customers, to the staff when we're talking about things is that, you know, without all of us working together, you know, the ice sports industry as we know it won't survive. And, you know, that's the message that we want to try to keep getting out that this is not about one facet of an ice rink or another facet of an ice rink it's about everybody working together to you know which kind of morphs into our you know our motto as well as you know we do you know creating lifelong skaters you know and that means that means a lot of different things you know that means 
creating a figure skater, creating a hockey player, creating just that family that likes to come and public skate with each other. Um, you know, that means kids that want to have birthday parties. I mean, creating somebody that's going to be in your building for the longevity of their lifetime is what it's all about. I mean, we're all about opening those pathways and giving you the resources and giving ICE facilities resources to be able to have those customers keep coming back over and over and over again. Um, you know, I feel passionately about what it is that we're trying to do on that front. I mean, we, the ISI really and truly is the only organization that looks at the entire industry as a whole. And as a membership organization, we serve, you know, the ice rank owners, the operators, the staff, the coaches, the skaters, you know, basically everything that's inside an ice rink, that's what we're, that's what we're about. And that's, that's who we want to serve on a daily basis. It was interesting for me to sit and listen. And I became so impressed with uh, people on the figure skating side of the world, even though I don't believe that those spikes should be on skates because all they do is put holes in the ice and, and damage it for the hockey players. But to listen to Jean Albertson and the passion that she had and the knowledge she had about the ISI, she's an incredible person, uh, a former, she's a part-time Minnesotan, um, not a former Minnesotan like I am, but um, what an incredible person and what she's provided to the organization and other people like Debbie and Jerry Lane. I've had the opportunity to spend time with them as well. And, and, and maybe you can share a little bit more about those people or uh, additional people within the organization and what they bring to the table. And it's all on a volunteer basis, is it not? It is. And I think that's, you know, that's the unique thing about an organization, you know, such like ours is that it is, you know, we are, we're, a, you know, we're a nonprofit business organization, which means that, um, you know, we have a board of directors that, you know, you serve on currently. Um, I served on for 11 or 12 years. Um, and I think that's what's incredible about the situation is that, you know, much like you said, it opens your eyes and your ears to so many more things than what your tunnel vision is or what your what you feel like your role is in the industry. And, um, you know, the board of directors are people that volunteer their time to support the ISI on a daily basis. Um, you know, the ins and outs of coming to meetings a couple times a year and, you know, having a cocktail and having dinner together and all the good times, you know, it is a little bit like, um, you know, high school reunions almost every year, right? Getting to see each other and see old friends. And, you know, some of us only see each other once a year and some see each other a lot. But um, I think that's the power of the industry as we know it uh, for the ISI is these people care so deeply about it. And for them, you know, much like for me, you know, it's a little cheesy, but I mean, this really isn't a job. I mean, this is, this is my life. This is my career. This is my passion that I chose to now be part of this organization. Um, you know, and I think, I think that's interesting. I just, you know, a little side note is that that's what so much what I love about doing what I do today is, is because I feel like I can bring a super unique perspective. Um, because I, I mean, I always say this to the board. I was one of you. I mean, I served on the ISI board of directors for 11, 12, 13 years. I was a skating director. Um, I was a senior skating director and ran eight facilities in the Dallas area. I was a coach. I coached for years. Um, I was a skater myself, you know, and then also working, you know, in the ice rinks, learned of all the other kinds of things to do, like how to sharpen skates, how to take care of rental skates, again, how to drive a Zamboni. You know, what does, you know, what does dehumidification mean? You know, what does, what is an edger? Um, and I think that that is what's really cool. And I, and I appreciate you saying that earlier, because I feel like a lot of people that are in, were in your boat or people that were a vendor or people that sold dasher boards or, and then take it the other way, figure skating side that, you know, coaches that are like, well, I'm a coach. I just get on a nice piece, you know, clean piece of ice and teach my kids. I don't care. It it allows them to take a step back and go, you know what? I should care about everything in this rank because everybody has a role 
and it makes us a better facility and therefore gives us better customer service. You know, I'm kind of making some notes as you talk and uh, as I told you with this, it kind of the responses I get leads me down a different path. And, and it's funny, one of the things that popped into my mind, and I don't remember if it was from my schooling for radio broadcasting where we had to take a sales side of it or not, but it's everyone who comes in contact with your product is a customer. Uh, yeah. And I think that like you just mentioned about how some of the coaches may not be interested in learning about some of the stuff. If people do expand their knowledge base, they have a better understanding of what, how they can impact either positively or negatively somebody else within, um, within the organization. And, yep. you know, I, I also thought back to uh, Mr. Hartnett, my great, 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 great grandfather, um, who is going to be part of another podcast today, uh, our dinosaur uh, edition. And uh, neither he nor I know what a Wally Wally or a Twizzle <laughs> or any of the other moves that you guys can do. But I remember him listening in to try to understand so that he could see both sides of the fence. And I think that's what you're doing as well. And the last thing I'll throw at you is, do you consider yourself the caretaker of the ISI? Because it's not, you say it's not a job. That's a word I've heard in a lot of places where they're, they're sitting and, and, and looking over this. Would you view yourself as a caretaker? Oh yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, honestly, I don't, you know, the older that I get, I don't know about you, but I feel like I get more emotional about things than I should. Um, but a hundred percent, I mean, you know, probably the segue into the COVID conversation. I mean, this, you know, there's no, there's no way to sugarcoat how difficult this year has been for everybody. Um, and how difficult it's been for, you know, the ISI as an organization, just the nuts and bolts of it and the logistics of it, but how hard it's been for me in the role that I play in this organization, knowing that all of our members are suffering. Like that's, that's huge. And that's a, that's, that's so much. And it's hard to convey um, to people without sometimes other people feeling like that's insincere because, you know, a lot of people probably think, oh, what, why do you care? You know, you just take our money. Well, it, that could not be farther from the truth. You know, I, I, you know, have a huge responsibility for carrying on this organization that started in 1959. And I do not take that lightly, um, you know, which is probably why my wine bill has been astronomical over the last year. <laughs> but um but I mean, I joke about it, but it's true. It's a, it's, it's not a bur burden. It's a responsibility, but one that I take incredibly seriously. Um, and there was no way, you know, on God's green planet that this organization was going to go under, under my watch. It just wasn't, you know, um, and it won't. I mean, we are, we are doing well. Um, there is such a huge light at the end of the tunnel compared to last fall. And um, it's so encouraging to see our ice rinks opening day by day with programming coming back, whether it be hockey or public or freestyles. Um, you know, day every day it's changed. It's it's phenomenal. As much as every day changed last year when we were first shut down, every day right now is changing with more and more people getting back to what it is that they love to do, being part of the ice rink. Well, and I'm going to take and put on my ISI board member hat and thank you and the rest of the staff for all that you've done to keep things afloat. And also want to remind our listeners that um, the ISI is a member organization. So that means it's your organization and the tools that the ISI has to offer uh, are yours to use. And if you've got suggestions, you've got needs, um, reach out to the office, reach out to Liz and they will do what they can to help you out. And correct me if I'm wrong here, Liz, maybe go into a bit about the ISI and that it is to help, you know, what it was founded on and what it is till today is to generate revenue for the facilities. And I think that's even more important now in trying to navigate through the rest of COVID until we get to the other side. So maybe you can share a bit about that and uh, what the benefits are of being a member of the ISI. 
Yeah, I mean, 100%, Doug, for sure. That, you know, I'll digress for two seconds. I sat in a um, conference, of one of our conferences several years back, and we had a speaker from Disney, and he was phenomenal. And he told a huge long story, um, but what it led to in terms of the end, the bottom line was, is that every leader, every manager, leader of an organization or what have you, should ask the question why back seven times. I don't know if you remember that or not, but he said you should ask why. So when something's presented to you of a process or a procedure, ask why, why do we do that? And then you get the answer. And then when that answer is coming, well, why do we do that? Well, why do we do that? And he said, if you answer that back seven times, you may get all the way back to an answer that makes zero sense anymore, right? It may make sense or it may not, but the responsibility is to ask the why so that then you can better serve your members, serve your customer moving forward. Um, I took that to heart and back in 16, 17, when I took over, as the managing director, I started really doing that and asked my staff to do that. And what that led us to is better processes, better procedures, asking our customers and our members, what do they need? And so on a daily basis, we look at our mission statement and then when we're getting ready to do something or not do something, we ask ourselves, does it serve the mission? will this provide leadership education or services to our members and if the answer is no we don't do it um if the answer is yes we figure out how to make that happen um so you know several years before you know last year we we um we revamped our database internally we upgraded our website we started realizing that people needed information more efficiently more effectively. And so much like many organizations, no reinvention of the wheel here, we got way more digital, right? And we scaled down our newsletters and targeted members. So now we send out targeted email blasts to just coaches, to just builders and suppliers, to just managers and operators. And we found that the open rate on those emails is so much higher because it's shorter content, it's relevant content, they can read it, boom, good to go. Um, so I think all of those things and during COVID, we, during the pandemic time, we really had to take a step back and go, how can we help our members? Our members are suffering. So many of them are sitting at home. They don't know if their ice rink is going to open or not open. And so, you know, we did like so many organizations did, and we started the Zoom process. <laughs> and, um, you know, we hosted regional meetings. We hosted national meetings. We hosted meetings with just coaches. We had a meeting with just operators and it, it was just our way of connecting and it, it there wasn't always an agenda sometimes it got way off topic people just wanted to talk and connect and network and realize that there are more than just them out there across the united states feeling the same way that they're feeling which you know goes back to a comment i've always made being part of the isi organization when i used to go to conferences before I worked for the organization, is the networking was such a crucial part, such a crucial part. And I would say to myself, you know, sometimes it wasn't what I learned, it's what I didn't learn almost in terms of validating what I was doing at my facility or what we were doing. Um, and that's so powerful because sometimes you just need to know you're doing the right thing, right? Um, but, you know, a little bit more pointed towards what it is that we have to offer in terms of right now is my biggest thing right now is we are helping. We answer the phone. If you call our phone number, we answer the phone. We will talk to you for as long as you want to talk and are helping people through what they need to be helped with. Um, I, you know, I would say if somebody asked me, what do you do on a regular, regular day, you know, it's talking to customers, it's talking to members, it's talking to coaches, it's talking to the operators and the managers saying, okay, um, I wanna run a skating competition, how can I do it safely? Um, you know, uh, other questions like how, any suggestions on how to run a public skating, skating session, you know, along with all the other logistics of like, um, what kind of point of sale system should I use? Who should I look into? Um, you know, we need more rental skates, who should I look to buy those from? 
So a lot of it is just helping these member ranks get up and going again. Well, and I, I think one of the things that I got out of the regional Zoom meetings or the district Zoom meetings is just the ability to realize that even though I'm a, on the vendor side of things, which is a bit different than operating an ice rink, to realize that other people are going through the same things that we are or that I am. And, and I think, you know, you're almost a counselor uh, or a therapist to some of the people that are calling in. They, they want to reaffirm that they're not nuts and uh, how they feel about what's going on in the world uh, is uh, other people are feeling the same way. So it, it's I think that that's a big part of just being a good individual and the ISI being an organization wanting to help out its membership. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's been the best part, I guess, you know, ever, you know, <laughs> everybody always wants you to see the silver lining on something, right? And and that's a good thing too, um, to see that. And I think that has been the good thing that I think there were, there's over the last so many years, technology has increased so much that maybe we haven't spoken on the phone as much, or maybe we haven't, people don't take the time to come to a conference or come to a district seminar or come to a manager's meeting or those kinds of things because everybody's too busy. Um, quote unquote, I'll say busy in quotes, by the way, because that's, don't get me started on my favorite quote. Um, anyway, the point is, is that it allowed people because they they were forced to take a step back, forced, you know, to kind of reassess a little bit, but it allowed them the opportunity to communicate and network better. I mean, we had some calls with managers and operators that I hadn't seen in years. I mean, it's it was phenomenal. And the other thing that was so great and I think, you know, magical in a way about it is having vendors like, you know, people like you on a call with coaches on a call with skating directors on a call with a manager or an operator because everybody could see that no matter what your role with was or is within an ice rink that you were struggling with the same things you know that they couldn't teach their skaters or that they couldn't open for public or you know that there's only two guys in the rink you know and they're changing all the light bulbs right now you know i mean it just it you just can't say enough about it. I know you just said it, but you just cannot say enough about how that I believe helped people, you know, along the way. Tell our listeners how the ISI is navigating through the world we are living in, which your world is a little bit different than ours out here in California. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's a, a little bit looser there, which I'm uh, sure you're enjoying. Um, and how you're getting by without face-to-face -face meetings or events and what the future holds for those types of events. Yeah, that's good. And I think the thing is, again, I said it earlier, day by day by day, if we had had this podcast conversation four weeks ago, it would have been completely different than having it today, right? So, so many more ice rinks are opening. Basically, we've seen since January 4th, um, a lot of rinks that had opened. And when I mean open, I mean open based on their criteria, um, based on their percentages that they were allowed to have in their building, that sort of thing, um, limited programming and such. Since January 4th, a lot um, back in November, December, as you remember, a lot of those facilities had to take a pause again. And as of January 4th, they've slowly, slowly, slowly come back on. So we actually hosted a national event that was supposed to happen in December. And ironically, it did not get canceled due to COVID. It got canceled because the poor ice rank lost their, um, lost their ice. And so we had a we had a remove we had a move and reschedule to the first weekend of January. So we actually hosted a face to face on ice skating competition in January. It went fantastic. You know, everybody wore their mask, everybody social distance. We as an organization changed up uh, how we did things. You know, just less less um, less touch points, all that kind of thing. Um, and it went great. It went fantastic. And what it allowed us to do is um, Kim our um, national events coordinator and director of those those type of events was able to come up with like a list of how to run quote unquote a national event being safe in the time of COVID. And what what's happened is 
that's morphed itself. We've gathered that kind of information from other skating directors and competition directors across the United States to help members when they're getting ready to host their um, face-to-face -face competitions next that they can work within those parameters. You know, I think the important thing to remember is that the ISI organization doesn't tell anyone how to run their business. We are all about making suggestions, giving them best practices. Everybody has to do what works for their state, their city, their county, or whatever is whatever they are going to have to abide by. And that's different for everybody. And that's, you know, that's the challenge. It's also the good thing, but it's also the challenge, right? Because what works, like you just said, in Dallas, Texas, isn't going to work in, you know, Pasadena. Um, but we're, we're being able to help navigate that. I would say to date, like just this past weekend, there were five, um, there were five face-to-face -face competitions all over the United States. There was one in Minnesota, um, District 8 and 9, which is the Chicago, St. Louis area. They had a face-to-face -face competition. So it's so great to see everybody literally moving forward with that. Um, we have moved our annual conference um, to September. So originally that was planned, <laughs> I'm sure like everybody else, that was planned for spring of 2020, kicked the can down the road because you know, everybody thought, oh, we'll be fine by April, May, right? Kick that can down the road. And so we felt it was in the best interest. It's in Pasadena, California, and with California lagging just a bit behind, we really wanted to still continue to host it in Pasadena. We think that's the right thing to do. Everybody wants to get to sunny California at some point. So we will be hosting our face-to-face conference and trade show in September, September 28th and 29th um, in Pasadena, California. Um, in the meantime, we're going to try something new um, and we're going to host what we, we're calling the ISI Connect. And that's going to be a virtual experience and that's going to be April 19th and 20th. And it's, you know, it's not a conference. It's a virtual experience. It's um, an opportunity for us. We're gathering a lot of like-minded experts in their fields to talk about all sorts of different things. And so we're gonna have, um, you know, content for coaches, content for managers, operators, um, you know, all the gamut. It's just gonna be two days and, um, you know, very low price point and opportunity for members to get some virtual education, basically. It's something I think that people will, uh choose to do so that they can reconnect with some of the people that are going to be speaking, uh, maybe learn some things that they should be uh, trying to do as they come out of this. And there's a lot of differences in the rink world that uh, a lot of different challenges that they're going to be faced with that they've never had to face before because of the amount of time that facilities have had to be shuttered. So um, that's yeah. something great. Yeah, I was just gonna pop, I was just gonna pop in really quick, and because I, I should have mentioned it earlier. Yeah, I mean, definitely, a lot of the topics are gonna be, you know, um, Rob McBride, who's our current president of the ISI Board of Directors. He's gonna do a session on, you know, leading in the time of COVID, and he's gonna talk a little bit about his experiences um, running the facilities that he does in Massachusetts and how they've navigated that, which I think, you know, be very powerful for people to hear. And I think you know, moving forward, so much of what ice rinks have have had to do, I think they're going to move forward, still continue to use those. The amount of people, the amount of ice rinks that were not using like online platforms like point of sales or online registration systems. I mean, I've heard from numerous members that were forced to do an online registration system over the last six to eight months. And they're, they, of course, you know, that's what we all do, right? Why didn't we do this sooner? <laughs> so, you know, they're not turning back. And um, some of the other topics, you know, um, they're going to talk about, you know, some of the other safety concerns, you know, what, what worked, what didn't work, what should we take forward in terms of, you know, cleanliness of the building, you know, all those kinds of things. What, what pieces of those should we continue to take forward in our ice rinks as we move forward into the, you know, into the season? As the ISI is a membership-driven organization, can you share with us and our listeners the different types of memberships that the ISI offers and what those, what maybe what some of the benefits or the differences, different benefits are for the different membership groups? Sure. I mean, basically, you know, 
you know, the primary membership that we have is our administrative membership, um, which is a membership for a rink, a club, or a skating school. And that is, you know, that's the big daddy. That's the, the membership that allows you to use our programs, um, to use the ISI skating school program, uh, to have resources available to them for everything else. You know, obviously, you know, all the little minor things like gives you discounted member rates on um, coming to any of our educational content. Um, we really, for lack of a better way to say it, we really try to offer as much value to every membership as we can and not quote unquote nickel and dime everybody. Um, you know, as we said, we are a membership organization, a nonprofit business. We do have to sustain ourselves as we obviously have operating costs to cover that sort of thing. But, you know, it's about the services that we can offer to our members. The administrative membership is kind of the all encompassing. Um, it allows your staff to come to our, what we call our ISI university for people that have been around for a long time. That used to be called IAIM. And basically that's our educational school where, um, you know, people can earn certificates in different areas, programming, management, operations, and actually earn an educational certificate that they can, you know, use in their, <clears throat> you know, use in their facility, they can use on their resume. Um, that has gone through a huge revamp over the last several years. It was getting ready to launch a whole kind of new platform, a new or a new way that it was going to look back in 2020. And of course, of course with, COVID, with the pandemic and COVID, that kind of made us take a step back. So we, we hope to be able to relaunch that um, because I think, you know, the purpose of all of that is to educate people working in ice rinks and allow, allow them and give them the tools needed to, you know, be a better worker, be a better staff member, be a better leader, a better manager, a better programmer. Um, you know, we also offer, um, we have a professional membership, which is for coaches, uh, ice skating, uh, figure skating or hockey. Um, we offer liability insurance. Most coaches out there these days, um, ice rinks will require that they hold a general liability policy of insurance. Um, so we offer that to our members as well. We have a skater membership that is their annual membership that allows them to compete, to test, um, you know, and to be involved in our program. We offer individual hockey memberships. We have probably the best um, hockey insurance offered out there. We offer uh, hockey insurance for teams and um, it's a very, it's an economical deal for facilities that are running their own in-house leagues. So if somebody was really interested in being a member and an individual member, might they be able to get a uh, individual membership to help support the ISI? Like, I don't know. <laughs> We're always looking for help for sure. Um, anybody can be a member of ISI. I mean, you know, heck you could be a skater member and not really skate if you'd like to. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, um, we have a couple other memberships also. We have what we call, um, an associate membership, which, um, you know, not too many people grab onto these days, but was created a long time ago for people that, you know, used to be in the industry that still wanted to be supportive of the ISI organization itself. Um, you know, we always welcome membership, um, dollars anytime we can get them. I mean, for lack of a better way to put it, right. Um, but I think one of the, you know, one of the important parts, you know, as we're just talking about membership is I think one of the key factors that is important for people out there to realize is that it isn't, uh, how should I say it? It isn't one way or no way. I mean, ISI, again, has always allowed for anyone and ever, everyone. And I think, you know, again, I go back to our, you know, our motto of creating lifelong skaters. In order for an ice rink to be successful and whatever it is that your definition of success is, and that's different for everybody, right? But whatever your de definition of successful is, in my opinion, you should be able to offer as many programs and as many opportunities to your customers. So, 
Therefore, the ISI can run in conjunction with other programs already offered in your facility. And I think that if you look at a lot of the successful ice rinks out there that have something for everyone that is that offers a program for everyone, you will find that they aren't just a member of one organization. They are a member of multiple organizations to allow themselves the opportunity to offer all sorts of different programming and different opportunities to their customers. Well, and that's one of the things I've talked with you about and I talk with customers when I'm out visiting, I will wear my Zamboni hat primarily, but I put on my jet ice hat uh, when I'm in my territory talking to uh, potential customers and even put on my jet ice hat when I'm in uh, what's not my territory for that company uh, is that the ISI is does not have to be the only program that they run. Uh, and ISI wants to get along with all the other organizations that are out there. And I think that you guys do a great job of promoting, look, if you want to be an Olympian skater, you can start out at ISI, but the path that you are going to want to go is through USFS. And I just wish in this industry that there would be more um, synergy or more realizing that it doesn't help out uh, the whole, the industry as a whole when organizations are feuding. And I'm not going to throw stones, but uh, it, it is something because of our uh, company founder being a founding father of the ISI, Richard Zamboni being on the board and an executive on the board for many years and my involvement with it. Uh, I have a soft spot in my heart and that's I'm thankful that uh, you've I was finally able to finagle you to get on this podcast and happy that you joined us. Um, so Liz, could you tell our listeners, in addition to the virtual event that uh, you're going to be hosting here in April, um, what other things uh, are you offering and how can either members or non-members uh, become members and engage and be a big part of the success of the ISI organization? Well, I think it, it's twofold, and I think more things will, will come as day by day we can open up and allow ourselves an opportunity to kind of get out there a little bit more than we normally would. I mean, we have several, you know, national competitions already on the books for the rest of 21 and into 2022, so that makes us feel really, really confident about that. Um, you know, in terms of just engagement, it's like, reach out, go on our website, see what it is we have to offer. There's a lot of quote unquote free content on our website, you know, check it out. See, see if it's something that if you isn't happening in your facility, is it something that would be a good addition to your facility? Would being a member of the ISI benefit you along, along the way? I think, you know, I, I just, I have to go back just a little bit to what you said. We have, I think it's it's interesting. There's been a little bit of misnomer. Like every people think, oh, we're members of ISI, you have to run the ISI skating school program. I mean, that they couldn't be farther from the truth. I mean, we have members all over the United States that are that run the gamut. I mean, we have people that are members of the ISI so that they can allow their staff to have continuing education at a member rate. We have um, you know ice rinks that are members because they have synchronized skating teams that do ISI synchronized skating. And that's all they do. Um, and I think that, again, I just have to, uh, yeah, I'll raise my hand and pat myself on the back and say for the ISI that our, our program, being a member of the ISI, allows the opportunity to have more programs in your facility that allows your facility to grow. And it's all about growing. And if we don't grow, the ice sports industry, none of us will be here a long time down the road. And um, that's just, that's something that everybody really has to take to heart and realize that, um, you know, growing an interest in ice skating is super important these days. There's so many other things that kids can, kids slash adults can go off and do these days, right? That's, you know, not as expensive, maybe not as cold, maybe not as far away, right? Um, so we all have to do our part for sure. But I'm not quite sure some of those activities are as, um, I don't know what the word is, it, it doesn't bring the family together. Like if we've got grandkids and they're into Fortnite, 
And when they're sitting there with their headsets on and engaged and screaming at the TV set, I look at things and uh, it's just something that um, it's not like a night out at the ice rink could be. And uh, there's a lot of things that are out there now competing for the discretional dollars. And I think that it's even harder now because of COVID and that some people may have lost their jobs or been furloughed for a period of time. And I think that skating is one of those things that's not high end as far as costs go. So I, it's certainly something, and I think your organization is doing a lot to help promote that. And it's about helping the members generate revenue so that they can stay afloat. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And yeah, it's exactly, I mean, finding ways to monetize your facility is, is key for us. Um, you know, and again, I go back to opportunities for customers, because if you don't have an opportunity for your customer to spend money in your facility, that's a problem. And so we, we need to help you figure that out. And I think, you know, just saying what you said, I mean, the ice ice sports industry in general is such a unique group of people. Like if you think about it, you know, wh where you guys sit. I mean, when you say you work for Zamboni, people are like, oh my gosh, Zamboni, right? Or anything. Like when I'm out with, you know, my kids' friends, parents, and they are they're like, wait, you know how to ice skate? Like the whole concept of skating and everything that evolves around a skating rink is unique and it's special and um, it should be celebrated. So I think if more and more people can get into an ice rink and go public skate, go to a hockey game, go watch the Zamboni go around and wave at the Zamboni driver, um, you know, right? I mean, it's it's a unique opportunity and it's 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 pretty dang cool. Skating is for everyone, Liz. And <laughs> skating the, the, the... Is for <laughs> Whether it's with the pointy picks on the the uh, toes of the skates or whether it's a hockey skate or whether it's a long blade and people are going around on an oval. Skating is for everyone and everyone should be out there enjoying it. Uh, the, the last tough question I'm going to ask you before we get into the foodie topics, because I like to consider myself a bit of a foodie. What is your vision or the vision for the ISI going forward? Uh, that's, I feel like that's a put on the spot kind of a question, especially, you know, I mean, when is it? It's only March right now. No, that was saying, the intent. That was the intent of the question to try to try to get you nervous and maybe your hands <laughs> sweat. And uh, I need another cup of coffee. There you uh, go. You know, honestly, I, I mean, again, I, I won't, I won't be too cheesy or maudlin, but, um, you know, the fact that the fact that the ISI organization and its member members are surviving this at this point in March is pretty phenomenal. And um, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel for everyone is, is just, it's, it's heartening and it's, it's fantastic. Um, you know, getting the phone call from the coach yesterday that said, Hey, we're opening. I get to go back to teaching. I need to renew my membership. I mean, it's just, that's phenomenal to me. Um, but I think in terms of the vision, you know, we, revamped a lot of our processes and procedures over this last year. And I feel like, you know, we've honed in on some ways to make our organization more efficient, make our organization better for our members. Um, and so my vision is to continue with a lot of that. I mean, as soon as, um, you know, we have, I have a lot of great ideas and we have a lot of vision, but you know, as with many things that takes money. And so, you know, I will be patient for that, but, um, you know, our vision will remain the same that it was, you know, when we kind of refreshed back in 17, which is bringing valuable resources, you know, and benefits to our members. And we will continue to do that um, and continue to promote ice skating as much as possible and help rinks. And um, we'll keep answering the phone. Well, I'm going to challenge people out there because I became an individual member. It was you a did. great deal. And I think that where else, you know, it, it's probably like three cups of Starbucks coffee to get a five-year deal from the ISI as a member. You get a magazine. 
there, there's all sorts of stuff and you're supporting a great organization that has helped out a lot of skaters and a lot of people and one of the, I'm going to offer up a couple stories in this one I'd like you to elaborate on the 90 plus year old lady who was a skater I believe up in Colorado and I think Debbie and Jerry are doing uh, a skating event uh, to memorialize her uh, I incredible story but the, the my personal story is um, going to I believe it was St. Louis and it was for one of the ISI nationals and to be the person who handed out the medals to the kids and to see their faces light up with joy that they received a medal for um, skating and, and winning in their event, whatever place it was that they came in. It, it For a, a hard soul like mine to soften up and, and almost bring a tear to my eye, that was an incredible moment. And that was like the moment that it was, okay, the epiphany of Doug in waking up and realizing this is what the ISI is about. And the ISI, you know, do they want to have people eventually become on to be Olympia, Olympic champions? They're not going to stop them, okay? But I think what I see from it is bringing kids together to learn a sport that they can do all of their lives. And, and, and that's for me was very heartwarming and I enjoyed that immensely. And I've had the opportunity a couple other times when com or the, the competitions have been out in my area to participate. And I, I, I want to thank the ISI and you and everybody else that has come before you for giving me that opportunity. But can, can you elaborate about the, the lady that uh, I referred to earlier? I will, uh, yeah, Yvonne Dallin, and um, she was she was incredible. She was skating at 90, and um, she passed away. Um, yeah, and so Jerry and Debbie Lane, they do a competition in the summer every year, and they created a an award, and they're going to give the Yvonne Dowling Award. But, I mean, she's just one of so many skaters out there. When you say to yourself, creating lifelong skaters, I mean – you can't get much more lifelong than skating when you're 90. Um, it's, it's incredible. Um, I think that that's the power of, of this organization. Um, you know, when you think of like Erica Amundsen, who I mentioned before was my coach, we have a, an award named after her and we hand that award out every year to someone that's embodied the spirit of Erica Amundsen, which was supporting and living the mission of the ISI, which she did. And, you know, I, frankly, I probably wouldn't be here today if it weren't for her. Um, and, you know, when you think about what you said about, you know, the joy of the skating, I mean, here I am, the age that I am, started off as a kid, I mean, skating, right? And a million years later, here I am running this crazy organization that I used to have a patch on my you know, skating jacket that said ISI on it. Um, that's, that's pretty incredible. And I, I, you know, I can only hope that there are other, you know, other skaters, other people out there, no matter who they are, that will want to be involved in this organization and serve any way that they can, whether it's in their facility or maybe on our board of directors or working in our office someday for that matter. Um, you know, I always say in my, you know, my friend and coworker Kim always says, you know, it's about the journey. And if you are not enjoying the journey, then you need to take stock. And I feel like ISI embodies that. It's about enjoying the journey. 1% of the 1% are going to the Olympics. And if you love ice skating, if you love working in an ice rink, if you love driving a Zamboni, if you love sharpening rental skates, do it and enjoy it and enjoy the journey that that brings each and every day. Um, we'll, we'll move on to some easier questions now. Uh, and the, this is one that I ask all the guests that participate on this. Um, White Castle, <laughs> yay or nay? Oh, definitely yay. And, and that I keep trying to tell the people that say no or they don't know what it is that I'm talking about. There's nothing better than a Crave case at two o'clock in the morning after you've been sitting at the bar for uh, maybe, uh, well, I don't know, a couple hours imbibing and maybe some 
tonic water and lime with maybe something <laughs> else mixed into it. But okay, I, two, lines. two lines. I, I, two lines. There you go. Okay. What would be your favorite food? And it can be White Castle if you want to have that be your favorite food. Well, that would just be sad. <laughs> I mean, I do love a Whitey One Bite, but that's, you know, that it's probably only, I really think I only love a Whitey One Bite because it takes me back to like my youth, you know? Um, or the, uh, do you, okay, sorry, digress. Small, do you remember, the, do they still have the fish sandwiches? We used to have them on Friday oh. during Lent, you know, the small fish sandwiches. At White sandwiches. Castle? At White Castle, oh, yeah. yeah. But the during chicken Lent. rings are, the chicken rings are one of my favorite where it's a circle <laughs> of chicken with a piece of cheese on top of it. <laughs> Stop. That makes me laugh. Like chickens are not meant to be a circle. Um, anyway, that is not my favorite food, but I will, I, it's probably a little cliche, but definitely my favorite food is Mexican food. I mean, chips and queso and guacamole, you can't go wrong. Uncle Julio's might be on the list of going. Uncle Julio's is on the list. There, there's, I don't know if that was where I had with Mr. Peduto, um, a jalapeno margarita. Is that one of their specials? Mm -hmm. Like a special? Spicy or is it a different place that uh, we might have gone to? No, I think you might have been at La Hacienda. Okay, but, th but that that was that was very good and enjoyed just a, maybe a couple of those. So, um, is the go-to place for barbecue in Texas for you the home of the Big Yellow Cup? <laughs> I do love me some Dickies, but um, <laughs> but that's probably not the best barbecue around. But it's good, and I, I this is going to be. I, I think I've used the word cheesy like five times this, this podcast, but I'm going to use it again. Um, to be frank, I think my favorite barbecue is my husband's. Like, he has a smoker and, you know, ribs and brisket. And then I have two neighbors down the street that are foodies that just make some incredible barbecue. It's just, so it's kind of hard to beat that kind of barbecue. And what kind of sauce do they use on their barbecue? Is it like North Carolina sauce where it's mm -hmm. more vinegar based or is it a more sweet based? barbecue sauce more more vinegar base you know homemade okay. but more vinegar base for sure okay best meal ever oh that's so hard i've had a lot of good meals a lot of good meals um okay this i'm gonna say this actually okay so in oregon when i lived there for a long time um our tradition on christmas eve is we would have seafood and we would have crab and so I know it's not out, it's not whatever, but I think my favorite meal would be like just, we would put um, butcher paper down on the table with candles and we have our own little individual ramekins of drawn butter and like big, huge, giant, fresh crabs. And just that's, you cannot beat that. That's phenomenal. There's one that uh, meal that comes to my mind and I'm going to guess that Ms. Paula might still have a signed menu. It was the mansion at Turtle Creek, um, which is in in your neighborhood, and absolutely yep. Rumbauer wine. It was so funny because we went there with Richard Zamboni, and we had Jeff Russell, his son-in-law, and uh, Frank Zamboni didn't get to go for some reason. I think he might have flown home early from a show, and it was spectacular. It was the best meal I've ever had in my life. Um, we went there for to start out. It was just going to be a drink. And you needed to have a sport coat to get sport into coat, the, right? <laughs> to, to, to the restaurant. And they borrowed Richard and Jeff's sport coats and they bring one for Richard. And his hand stopped about six inches up from the end of the sleeve. And Jeff Russell put his on and it went to about his elbow. And they said, well, I think we should probably change. But that was an incredible meal and one that I will never, ever forget. Favorite well, place that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just have to say one more because you made me think of it. Okay, I'm just going to say it really quickly. In Las Vegas, there's a place called Mon Ami Gabi, and it's a French restaurant at the bottom of the Paris Hotel. And you go and you have a steak and you have pommes frites and like 16 bottles of wine. And um, anyway, when you talked about, because I think we all went there one time, the whole Zamboni crew. And that's anyway, phenomenal, phenomenal meal. Was that quantity a bottle of wines to help you get through a speech it by might be. somebody? It might be. Um, so that, and looking, that, looking on the Bellagio fountains going off with, you know, Luciano Pavarotti and, you know, there you go. The whole experience. And I, I'm looking forward to when we can dine outside 
be by choice, not because we have to, like we're currently <laughs> doing in Southern California. <laughs> so favorite place that your travels have taken you to? Um, you know, that's maybe I haven't been there yet. No, I'm just kidding. Um we I went to St. Lucia on my honeymoon. I guess that's a little look cheesy. I'm using the word cheesy again. But St. Lucia's beautiful. Um, absolutely beautiful. I've been to Hawaii many times, as you know, and it's hard to um not think about Hawaii and the Black Sands beaches and all of that. Um, you know, to be to be honest, I'm I'm kind of a I'm kind of a I'm a low key traveler. I'm a down home traveler. I, you know, I have traveled some, but not like extensively like a lot of people have. But, um, you know, give me a cabin in Colorado looking at the mountains any day and um, I'll, I'll take that view for sure. Yeah, but unfortunately, in those mountains, they have this white crap that comes down and it's chilly. <laughs> That's why you just go visit. I, you, I'm not <laughs> living there. I'm not living there. Okay. And, and you're a big, Mighty Duck fan, right? Um, sure. If you want me to be, I will be. Is no, right it answer? was. You're you're a duck fan, correct? Unfortunately, it's not a Mighty Duck. It's that Oregon duck. Do you, do you have one of those duckbill hats or anything like that as a Oregon grad? Um, I have an entire closet with enough University of Oregon duck paraphernalia. Um, yeah, we're the fighting ducks, by the way. Make sure the you fighting understand ducks. that. Oh, okay. yeah, the fighting ducks. And, All you right. know, little, little tidbit, we are the one and only university school that actually got rights from Disney to use the likes of Donald Duck. Wow. wow. And that had to be pulling some serious strings to get that to happen. That was a long time ago. And guess what? Donald Duck's birthday is the same birthday as me. Wow. So, you know, there's, your, there's your little tidbit of phenomenal trivia that you can take with you. But not the same year, obviously. Obviously not the same year. <laughs> okay, last question. Who is the king of abstaining when it comes to votes? That would be Doug Peters, <laughs> our favorite host of Ask the Zamboni Experts podcast. Uh, and I think there was, some, there was another comment that I forgot. We, we love you, but... How, how maybe that you could elaborate a little bit on that if you recall that from a board meeting. I think um, that that is something that should never be spoken of ever again. <laughs> All right, Liz, want to thank you very much for spending time with us today and sharing about the ISI. For those of you that are listening, if you're not a member, please consider joining the ISI. You can join as an individual member, you can join as a rink member, you can join as a builder supplier member but uh, help this wonderful organization out. We want to thank everyone for listening in to another episode of Ask the Zamboni Experts podcast. Have a question for one of our experts or an idea for a future episode, please email your questions or request to info at Zamboni.com. For more information and additional podcast episodes, please visit Zamboni.com forward slash podcast or search Ask the Zamboni Experts on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. This is Doug Peters wishing you an ice day. <laughs>